Ja, so ist Dina. Sie kann es klar. Don't go any further. I don't speak any more Greek. Uh, my dad is from Volos, so hi, Volos. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about the internet. Now, we've already heard two speeches about the internet, Wikipedia in Greece, as well as, um, what was it, using your mind on the internet? Incredible stuff. So, me telling you that we think the internet should be a human right, you don't need to know anymore. So, I'm done. <laughs> um, my name is Costa Grammatis. Uh, I believe that we have the power to improve the human condition on a global scale. Uh, the, the reason for this is, is because uh, today we are in a world that is in a bit of a crisis. And uh, what we need to do to, to overcome these dilemmas that we're all in, Greece, all the other countries that are in the midst of a recession, there's starving people, there's people with no water. Uh, we need to address these issues head on. And myself and, and people like me all came together one day for six weeks in Berlin, a group called Palomar Five, to discuss these issues, to discuss how we could change the world. And uh, what we came across was, was some in, in incredible uh, ideas of, of how to, to, to address these issues. Um, and the number one thing that we learned was, was that people need to have the power to solve their own problems. Uh, there's a thing called the aid industry. I'm sure you've heard of it, right? I don't know why they call it an industry. If it was doing its job, there would be no more aid industry. So, and the story goes for this gentleman, William Kem Kwambe. Maybe you've heard of him. He gave a TED talk maybe a year ago. Um, he couldn't afford to go to school. The $80, the, the, the $80 it, it costs to go to school, he couldn't pay. So he spent the, the four years that would be his high school in, in the library. And he read physics books and, and textbooks, and he uh, tried his best to learn what he wanted to know. And with that information, he went and assembled a windmill. Uh, he basically reinvented the windmill. Uh, it, it took him four years. And, and some reporters came. They came and saw what he'd done, and they said, what did, what did you do here? And, and, and they took him to the United States to go talk about like, his windmill that he reinvented. And he was on the Today Show with Jon Stewart, and Jon Stewart asked him, you know, Haven't you, what do you think about America? What do you think about all these uh, techn technological innovations? You're a technological innovator in Africa. And he says, well, Google was pretty cool because he'd never, like, he, was on, he was on a TV show, and someone asked him what Google was, and, and he goes, what animals of Google? <laughs> And they put a computer in front of him, and he, and he Googled windmill. And when he found all of the instructions on how to build a windmill, he's like, where was this Google all the time? This struck all of us. This is ridiculous. Because how, how, why is this young man forced to reinvent technology that already exists? Why can't he just have information at his fingertips? So we, we went to work you know, doing some research, finding about that. 83% of the world is literate. 78% of the world has access to electricity, but only 26% of the world has internet access, which means five billion people are not online at this time. That's not cool. <laughs> it's not cool. <laughs> um, and, and as uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who was big into imperialism, once said, uh, as a general rule, the most successful man in life is the man who has the best information. And we agree. Um, let me tell you some stories uh, regarding education. In, uh, in India, this, this man, Suguta Mitra, he had an office in the slums of India, and he cut a hole in the side of it and put a computer to answer the question, could children teach themselves how to use a computer and maybe learn something along the way? Uh, his results were astonishing. Kids were going, playing with the computer on a daily basis and learning all sorts of things learning how to speak English. Nobody believed his results, so he took a computer, he put it out in the middle of nowhere where no English speakers were. He came back two months later, and the kids asked him, we need a faster processor and a better keyboard. <laughs> He's like, where did you learn all that? Where did you learn that? And they said, they're like, from the CDs you left us. And, 
and so it goes on. You know, if you, you can multiply the effectiveness of 10 teachers by 100 or 1,000 fold if you give children access to the internet. In Iran, you know, I'm, I'm, I bet most of you have seen this image. Nita Aga was shot and killed by the, the Iranian forces just for demonstrating. The video was put on YouTube, the most widely viewed death in all of human history. Millions of views, and it strengthened the revolution so much that I guess Iran had to turn off the internet. Uh, and, and, and some say that the, because Iran turned off the internet, that led to the slowdown and eventual stop of the revolution, among other things. Um, in Papua New Guinea, which is ranked 148 out of 182 on the Human Development Index, uh, Michael Samar, the prime minister, in, uh, has an idea to put a satellite up over his country because he needs to bring information services to all of his people. Those information services will promote his government, promote the work that he's trying to do, bring education to places. It's the first step in becoming a developed society in his eyes. We envision to empower our people through the power of information to enhance their quality of life and to be on par with their peers in developed urban centers and peoples of this world. In New Orleans, in America, the first thing that happened after the hurricane was they rolled out free Wi-Fi service. Intel donated $1.2 million worth of equipment, and the results were as follows. You would have thought you were bringing starving people food from the reaction on the street. Chris Drake, the Wi-Fi project manager. They used it to coordinate their efforts. It was amazing. Uh, internet penetration goes, uh, is, a cor is correlated to the gross domestic product of a country. The, the, the poorer you are, the less access you have to the internet. And it goes not just for the country, but for the people as well. In America, 38% of American households earning less than $25,000 annually do not have internet access, which is terrible because 95% of companies are using LinkedIn to find employees. Now, I worked in a soup kitchen in Boston for a little while. <laughs> and you, you could see the homeless every morning. They come in with their laptops, and they sit, they'd eat the free soup, and uh, they'd find jobs. It was incredible. Um, the internet is a tool that helps people to help themselves. We believe that the internet is a basic human right, and not only are we trying to uh, enforce the human right, like from a, from a political standpoint, but we're trying to make it happen, because four out of five people agree with us that internet access should be a human right. And five countries, including Greece, Greece started it. In 1999, Greece said that uh, they should legally protect, <laughs> yes. <laughs> In 1999, Greece said uh, they legally protect their citizens' rights to internet access, which I find incredible. Um, we plan to fulfill this human right, and uh, now your next question is like, how do you do that? <laughs> we have three big ideas. Lobby governments and industry in order to provide a free segment of their network. So let's say you have um, a, a, a telephone, tel telco company that pr provides uh, 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 cell phone services. 25% of that would be devoted to free services for anyone. Uh, or the government would roll out their own. We could build our own network, which would be like a satellite thing for the whole entire world, or we can buy existing infrastructure and repurpose it for this cause of free internet access for every person on planet Earth. The, the results of like, the lobbying, we have a few stories. In America, there was a company that nobody has really heard of called M2Z. They tried for four years to lobby the FCC to get a chunk of spectrum. Now, spectrum is basically um, the radio waves, uh, the license to use a certain amount of radio waves. Um, they were going to offer 768 kilobits per second for free. And the FCC, who was in charge of approving or denying whether that happens, said no. The reason why they said no is because 768 kilobits per second was too slow. Now, 768 kilobits per second allows you to download 12 megabytes in one minute, if that means anything to anyone. <laughs> Sorry, all the data. But just for, for purposes of comparison, the average download speed of America's biggest wireless network in 2010 is 988 kilobits per second. So between 768 and 988, I don't really understand why it's too slow. It's not that much slower. We think, some people say, that it's because of industry. Industry lobbied, and, and they're, of course, very afraid of free internet. How, how could you do that? Um, 
and the, the, the CTIA, which is in charge of lobbying on behalf of wireless uh, providers, says, we are pleased to learn that the FCC is closing uh, the spectrum debate and will continue to focus on finding a proper pairing for the spectrum, which I think is fascinating because what could be more proper than free internet for the whole of America? I don't know, what else would you do? In Panama, they tried something different. Ricardo Martinelli actually um, ran his campaign on the idea of we will provide free internet for all of our citizens. If I am elected, I will, I will uh, do this within 100 days. Uh, and he said, the project does not compete with private broadband providers because its aim is digital inclusion and not the provision of high-speed internet access. And he was elected, and he's rolling out free internet for all of Panama. We agree with him. We agree with this idea that you can have a free wireless service for all people to enforce the basic human right of internet access, which allows you to do things uh, in many different ways. Uh, and it will not compete with local telecommunications companies. You don't have to worry. So that's on uh, the, the size of lobbying government. Uh, and, and actually, on that, on that end, we uh, encourage you to talk to your government uh, wherever you are and, and see if you can make it happen. Uh, uh, on the second front, we're trying to build our own network. Uh, imagine internet access as ubiquitous as the air you breathe. Uh, the foundation that uh, we run is called humanright.org, and, and that would be the, the administrators of this idea. Uh, we, we were working with NASA and some other companies uh, to, to design a very low-cost satellite, uh, $4 million, $2 to $4.5 million each, put them up in space on the back of the burgeoning space tour tourism industry that's just beginning, or the low-cost launch vehicle companies called uh, like SpaceX. And then uh, for the easy sum of $1 billion, the whole entire world is connected, right? <laughs> easy. <laughs> now, I have a story for you because while I was in the cab on the way over here, the taxi driver was telling me, he says, look over there, you see that? That's the Olympic Stadium, the first Olymp Olympic Stadium. And I said, wow, who paid for that? And he says, uh, not the government, because the government didn't have any money. <laughs> the people paid for it. And he was really proud of that, and I love that, because I think we could do this too. Uh, 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 for comparison purposes, 48 hours of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, $1 billion. Two-day ceasefire, we're good. <laughs> 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 and if there's any billionaires looking to leave a legacy, we only need one. <laughs> Our third idea and my favorite idea, I only have five minutes, guys. So come on. <laughs> my favorite idea, I cannot, uh, like, I'm so excited about this, I, I, I'm, I'm getting really excited, it is to recycle old infrastructure. I'm really into recycling, you know? You take the old stuff and you turn it into brand new stuff. There's an interesting thing going on right now. There's a company called Terrastar that's been bankrupt as of October 19th, 2010. They own the world's most powerful communication satellite ever put into orbit. Uh, this thing is like a, a bus. And what its job was, was to put internet and, and phone services for all of North America. Um, now that they're bankrupt, let's buy it. And let's move it over a country that could put some use to it, or a number of countries. There's a lot of places that are interested in this, Papua New Guinea being one of them, per se. The, uh, anyone who can see the value of the internet could see the value of providing free internet to its people. Um, and we're very much interested in that. The handset that will access this will be in available entirely open source, so we would, we would build something that would access the satellite and um, we could connect millions of people. This would be like the first shot. This would be the, the how, we, how we get started. This isn't just an idea, though. We made a website. <laughs> and my programmer, who's asleep right now, <laughs> just launched it today, buythissatellite.org. And uh, what our plan is, is to accept some donations. We're trying to raise $150,000. And with that $150,000, we're going to finish up some of our business plans, and we're going to go start talking to world leaders and those billionaires who might be willing to put down some money to take this satellite, move it to a new place, and do something truly incredible with it. Buythesatellite.org is, is what, what, we're, what we're trying to do. 
please go. Please spread the word. Um, my name is Kos Grimatis, and uh, I believe that internet access is a human right. I believe that we can enforce and bring this human right to every citizen of planet Earth. And I think it is imperative that we do this as soon as possible. I thank every one of you for being here today. I thank my team. There's about 100 people, volunteers from all over the world collaborating online to bring this vision to life. I thank NASA Ames, Deutsche Telekom, who's our primary funder, and everyone else who's helped. Thank you so much.